Portella presents I Have Lived a Thousand Years Growing Up in the Holocaust by Livia Bitten Jackson. This will be a preview of chapter one, which begins on page 12. The City of My Dreams, Samorja, Summer 1943 through March 1944. I dream of enrolling in the prep school in Budapest, the capital city. Budapest is a big, beautiful metropolis with wide streets and tall buildings and yellow streetcars whizzing around corners. All the streets of Budapest are paved. In our town, we only have one paved street, the main street, and it is not wide. We have neither tall buildings nor streetcars, only horse-drawn carts and two automobiles. One of them belongs to my friend's father. Ours is a small farming town at the edge of the Carpathian foothills. The lovely hills loom in a blue haze toward the west. To the south, the Danube, the cool rapid river, pulsates with the promise of life. How I love to swim in its clear blue surging ripples and lie in the shade of the little forest hugging its banks. We children splash all summer in the Danube. Families picnic in the grass. The local soccer team has its practice field nearby and the swimming team trains for its annual meet. Even the army camp empties its sweaty contents once a day, hundreds of recruits into the cool cleansing waters of the Danube. When the sun moves beyond the hills and the little forest casts a long shadow over the pasture, herds of cattle and sheep arrive at the Danube. The shepherds drive first the sheep, then the horses and cows into the water, cursing ever louder and drive us children out. The mosquitoes arrive too with the dusk and it is time to go home. The walk through the open pasture is pleasant and cool, but the town is hot and dusty when we reach home. The sheep arrive before us, and it is they who churn up the dust. But soon the dust settles, and so does the night. A dark, velvety blanket of silence wraps the town snugly against the intrusion of the outside world. The stars, one by one, light up the dirt roads and the single paved street of the town. By nine o'clock, all is quiet. Here and there, one hears the bark of a restless dog. Soon the dog, too, will be asleep. Then the orchestra of insects begins its overture, its harmony disrupted by the discordant croaking of a frog, an inhabitant of a small swamp just beyond the last houses of our street. I love to lie and daydream for hours after dusk. Life is an exciting mystery, a sweet secret enchantment. In my daydreams, I am a celebrated poet, beautiful, elegant, and very talented. My poems open the world's heart to me and I loll in the world's embrace. I yearn for my mother's embrace. When on Sabbath mornings, my friend Bonnie and I join our mothers in the synagogue, Mrs. Adler takes Bonnie in her arms and calls her Mein Schonheit, my beauty in German. Mrs. Adler always says German endearments to Bonnie. Mommy only greets me with a hello and a smile, no hug and no words of endearment. That's all nonsense, Mommy would respond to my complaint. Do you want me to call you Mein Schonheit? Bonnie's mother makes a fool of herself. Why, everyone can see how plain looking her daughter is. Why does it matter whether Bonnie is pretty? I care only that Bonnie's mother thinks she is beautiful. And what about the hug? I don't believe in cuddling, Mommy explains with a smile. Life is tough and cuddling makes you soft. How will you face life's difficulties if I keep cuddling you? You're too sensitive as it is. If I would take you in my lap, you'd never want to get off. You'd become as soft as butter, unable to stand up to life's challenges. Mommy's explanations are unconvincing. I believe she does not hug me because she does not think I am huggable. 
I believe she does not call me beautiful because she does not think I am pretty. I am too tall and ungainly. My arms and legs are too long and I keep upsetting things. When I carry a tray of drinks, mommy shouts at me not to walk so clumsily. That's the reason why everything spills. Look at Ava, she's a year younger than you, yet how deftly she carries a tray. Or, I was in your friend Julie's house yesterday. You should see how skillfully she helps her mother serve. Or, see your brother, Booby? He's a boy, and see how much more he helps out and how much better he is around the kitchen? This, I know, is the secret of my mother's disapproval. My brother. He is the favorite. He is good. He never answers back, my mother says, and never asks, why do I have to, when she tells him to do this or that? Why can't I be like him? Why can't I look like him? My brother is good looking and I am not. I am far from being pretty. He has curly hair and I don't. My hair is straight. There is not even an inch nation of a wave. There is not even an inclination of a wave. What a shame, I hear my mother say to a neighbor. Who needs such good looks in a boy? I mixed these two up. My son should have been the girl and my daughter, her looks would be fine for a boy. And there is another thing. My brother Booby looks like my mother's four brothers. Mommy refers to them as my beautiful brothers, the three words as one. Booby talks like them, he walks like them, and he acts like them and he is brilliant like they are. I am like my father's family. They are okay, but they are less dazzling. They are made of much plainer fabric. Booby has ability and I only have ambition. You see, I get good grades because I like to study, but my brother gets good grades without ever opening a book. Mommy is very proud of him. Daddy praises me for my ambition. He says ambition is sometimes more important than ability. You can sometimes accomplish more with ambition than ability. I wonder, does the fact that I have ambition mean that I have no natural ability or talent? How will I ever become a celebrated poet without talent? Can I get there by ambition alone? Look, Ellie, mom explains. You have a pretty smile, and when you smile, your face becomes quite pretty. Whenever you meet people, say hello with a smile, and people will take you for a pretty girl. I listen and smile whenever I can. The summer passes, and my brother Booby leaves for Budapest. He is a student at the Jewish Teacher Seminary there, and how I hope and pray that my dream of joining him next year will come true. Dark, rainy days of autumn freeze into glistening white winter. The gloom of the Hungarian occupation, the slow drag of the war, and increasing food shortages thicken the winter chill. Hitler's shrill radio broadcasts, especially one of his oft-repeated promises, we will play football with Jewish heads, strike panic in my heart. Daddy reassures me, don't worry, little Ellie. It's only a manner of speaking. Don't take it literally, God forbid. Sharp lines of pain etch his square, handsome face as he lets his hand rest on my shoulder. Don't even think about these things, Elike. Just forget you ever heard them. But I cannot put the vision out of my mind. Bloody heads rolling on the local soccer field become a recurring nightmare. As the winter wears on, my father's erect posture begins to stoop somewhat. His silences become longer and the shadows under his cheekbones deeper. Ever since the Hungarian occupation three years ago, when our business was confiscated, daddy has become more and more distant. His famous wit has become caustic, his laughter a rare treat. He seems to derive pleasure only from study and the endless winter evenings find him pouring over huge folios of the Talmud. On my birthday, February 28, the snow starts to melt. Spring is in the air. Daddy has cheered up a little and it makes my heart sing with joy. I have turned 13 and it promises to be a wonderful spring. 
I got a new coat with shoulder pads that make me look less thin and more mature. I look at least 15 in that wonderful navy coat with high shoulders. Even Jonsky Novak, the heartthrob, smiled at me and said, oh, 